Hi there, my name is Ryan Marr and I'm a guitar player and composer in the Portland, Oregon area. And I'm here today to talk to you all about free play, the art of spontaneously composing music. And usually when I do this clinic, it is uh, geared towards spontaneously composing music collectively with other musicians. And that's by and large the main uh, intent of what we'll be doing today. Um, but right now, playing music with other people is difficult because of the pandemic. Um, so this is also geared towards you being able to spontaneously compose music on your own, um, whether that's just in your practice room um, or if you wanted to do some kind of spontaneously composed live stream concert from your Facebook feed or Instagram, that would be cool too. Um, we, uh, you know, this is a, a jazz festival, the Gene Harris Jazz Festival, and um, as we know, jazz uh, improvisation is an integral part of what makes jazz jazz. Um, and I just want to make a quick aside that this is not necessarily jazz. Actually, it is not jazz. I'm just going to make that definitive statement. What we're doing today is not jazz. Um, so um, if the word <laughs> jazz and improvising kind of conjures up any notions of fear, um, let's put those to rest real quickly. This is a fun thing to do. And... Um, and it's also a very fulfilling thing to do. And it's where a lot of magical moments can happen musically when we're um, freeing ourselves up and playing. Um, I really put, you know, there are two simple words in the title, free play, but they're also powerful, meaningful words. Um, I'm hoping that we can uh, play as if a child plays with a new toy. Um, and also uh, we can do it freely or unencumbered. Um, I don't mean free in the sense that there are no boundaries or rules. So I'm looking forward to this and here we go, let's dive in. So the word free is in the title here. And as I mentioned just previously that uh, free does have meaning here. One thing I wanna make sure that we know uh, is that the word free does not mean something too. And free does not mean that there are no boundaries or lack of rules or that this is gonna be chaos or noise. That is not the intent of this clinic. We are gonna be making music that I think a lot of people will enjoy. Um, they may not understand it completely, but that's okay. Um, there are a lot of beautiful things in the world that not everyone understands. Um, so uh, don't take the word free to mean wild or uh, without any rules, okay? Um, and there's a few th other things that uh, this process that we are going to undertake is not. And one of the things that it is not is jamming. Um, jamming is sort of a bad word in this context. It's not a bad word in general, um, but jamming to me uh, implies kind of lack of direction or lack of focus um, and uh, implies sort of like a sense of aimlessness. Um, and uh, whether that's fair or not, that's kind of just how I'm seeing this. And those are types of approaches that I'm hoping to avoid in this process. We are aiming to capture magical musical moments and, and they hopefully will sound like a piece of music um, that is intentional and uh, complete. Um, so those are words to keep in mind as well. Um, and uh, I did mention that this is not jazz. Um, in fact, this is not intended. This, uh, the intent here is to, for it to not be anything. It, this type of music does not have a genre. It is intentionally without genre. It is non-idiomatic, which is a big word. But um, we're not going to be drawing from any one specific musical language. Um, and that is the intent. Now, that's somewhat impossible. It's like asking ourselves to not be ourselves, which we understand we can't do. We have to be ourselves. I'm, I guess I consider myself a jazz musician, um, but when I'm doing this process, I'm not trying to play, you know, music that emerged out of the bebop tradition, you know. Um, I'm trying to forge new areas and uh, come up with new things, and I'm doing it collectively with other musicians, or like I mentioned, in the opening as well, doing it um, when we do it just by ourselves. So we're trying to shed all of the language that we know 
when we're doing this process, um, which is a very difficult thing to try to do. Um, but all that we ask is that you try. Um, we're not asking that you be perfect and completely forgetting who you are as a musician and everything that you've learned. Um, one of the reasons why we are doing this is because uh, it allows more of us to be able to play with each other. It is uh, very inclusive, this process, because um, if we shed the idea that uh, our music has certain markers of language, like jazz language or classical language, then we can play with more people um, if we agree on some some rules. Um, it's not too dissimilar from uh, spoken language, like, you know, I'm speaking English, and if I was dropped off in a country where no one speaks English and uh, I needed to find certain things to ensure my survival, I'd like to think I'd be able to communicate a few things, even though we may not speak the same language. And uh, it's not too dissimilar from what we're going to be doing here musically. Um, so um, this is all about communication and communicating the things that are most important. And it's exciting at the same time because we're doing it in real time and we're improvising it. So it's it's a very exciting process. Um, and uh, sometimes improvisation can kind of conjure up fear in, in us. Um, there are probably many students out there watching that uh, can relate to when they're asked to improvise a solo in front of their peers and in front of their instructors that uh, they get nervous and they don't want to play all the wrong notes and all of these things and um, th this is hopefully going to break down some of those barriers of fear um, because there are no wrong notes um, there are no wrong rhythms um, we get to play um, and as we're going to talk about that doesn't mean that you just get to play anything that you want whenever you want at all times that's kind of one of those things that I'm saying is a bad thing. It, you know, um, it's not completely free. We want to do things respectfully and listen to each other and that kind of thing. But uh, you don't have to be afraid about playing the wrong notes. Um, so um, let's talk about when and where we can do this. Um, we can do this in class. Uh, if we are in jazz band, um, maybe we can convince our instructors of jazz band to carve out some time uh, during rehearsal, maybe once a week, maybe once every couple weeks. I'm not sure how it's up to you guys to figure out when you do this, but carve out some time to create uh, improvised music in your ensemble classes. I mentioned jazz band um, just because I know that a, a lot of you are here because of the jazz festival, um, but it could be in your symphonic band. It could be in your choir. Um, if you have other kinds of um, genre uh, specific ensemble classes in your school, talk to them about improvisation and, and um, tell them that, you know, improvisation is not just jazz, that we can improvise uh, in any kind of musical setting. And because we can do this kind of process in nearly any musical setting uh, or in any ensemble class, um, we can combine ensemble classes um, and perform this stuff uh, and not just perform it, but also practice it and do it in class. So we could have uh, our jazz band sit in with choir one day and, and work on improvisation together and communicate across genre lines. Um, you also could try to form your own improvised music ensemble that incorporates uh, other students from other band classes, or, you know, you might have even like local rock bands. Uh, you know, I had a garage band when I was in high school and uh, that was outside of our normally scheduled band class, you know, so I'm sure that you guys have, um, uh, you know, local garage band, rock band types uh, around and uh, who's to say that they couldn't be involved too. So you can have an improvised music ensemble um, and you could even put together a little concert or have it be part of your normal school and co uh, school concerts. Um, it could be a dedicated concert of just improvised music ensemble or just improvised music. Uh, and you could also just pepper in one or two performances of completely improvised things um, in your normal ensembles. So that's a little bit about what this is. So we can talk a little bit about where this comes from and then quickly move on to how to do this. Um, because I'm sure you're all ready to play. Um, this kind of approach comes from my studying Karl-Heinz Stockhausen music. And 
Uh, he was a 20th century uh, composer that pioneered a lot of this approach. And um, one of the things that he mentions in a, a lengthy interview on this process is that the ensemble size, how many people are making music at one time, probably should not exceed seven musicians. Um, and uh, there's a pretty good reason for that. If everyone, if there's more than seven people improvising music uh, at one time, it can get a little bit cacophonous, which is a big word for noisy and wild. Um, so uh, no more than seven is advised by Carl Hench Stockhausen. I have found in my doing this that uh, the ideal number is kind of between three and five musicians at one time. Um, it leaves more space, but also generates uh, a more um, uh, motion in the compositions that we create than having one or two people do it. Um, and uh, of course, there's every there's exceptions to all rules, right? So there is a, a really great composer slash feature. Uh, it's got a lot of titles named Walter Thompson that does large ensemble improvised music with his process called sound painting. And that one, um, it has like a lot of rules and hand gestures. And um, he, he basically conducts a very large ensemble um, in improvised music. Um, but there's like a lot of rules um, and everyone's on the same page. Um, so that's a kind of option, you know, maybe your uh, band director would like to come up with their own set of rules. Um, but uh, in general, three to five musicians at a time. And another way that uh, we want to ensure that it doesn't get too wild and too aimless and um, we want to have more success. So some things that we can do to make sh ensure success or, you know, give us uh, ourselves the largest probability of success um, is to have some guidelines uh, is a decent word for it. Um, just letting you all run free uh, could yield some interesting results, but I think there would be a lot of uh, a lot of missed opportunities. Um, so by setting up some simple guidelines, we can kind of get the compositions off and running. So um, what are some guidelines that we can have? Um, we're definitely going to uh, cover that in a, a future slide. Um, once you have been doing this for a while, you can start to free yourself up from the guidelines. Um, you don't need a prompt or an image or whatever to start a piece every time after you've developed some rapport with your fellow improvising musicians. And um, yeah, it's kind of like anything. The more you practice it, the better you're gonna get at it, especially if you pay some, um, pay some attention to the details and stuff. All right, we're almost there. We're almost ready to play. But before we do that, let's cover a couple ground rules. I know rules, everyone loves rules, right? Um, rule number one, is um, no genre stuff. Try to avoid playing something that can be categorized into a genre. So if you're playing drums, don't play your newest funk beat. Or if you're playing guitar, don't play some power chordy kind of punk rock thing. If you're playing saxophone, don't do some Chad LB riff or, you know, or Charlie Parker lick or something like that. Try to do something that's outside of uh, a genre that you can recognize. And then rule number two is throw everything that you know about the music out the window. Throw just, you know, we're starting from scratch. We're like inventing our own style of music is kind of how this goes. So um, rule number two is almost like there are no rules, but it's the second rule. <laughs> um, so uh, with that in mind, uh, we want to do all of this stuff, you know, respectfully. So. Um, one thing we do want to do is to take this seriously. Now, it doesn't have to be so serious that it's not fun. Uh, we want it to be fun. We want it to be fulfilling. It's, the word play is in here for a reason, right? Um, but we do need to take it seriously. So, um, you know, try to avoid snickering or laughing, uh, you know, because you're, uh, it, it, because of an awkward moment or, um, try to avoid like cheekiness, you know, um, we're trying to create good music here. And, you know, if you aren't going to laugh in a, uh, uh, you know, serious symphonic band piece, don't, don't laugh during, you know, one of these, uh, improvised pieces that we're going to make. Um, and another thing is that while we're doing this, we should try to treat it like a performance. So, you know, it should have a beginning and a middle and an end. And um, 
uh, if we just treat it as as if you were starting a tune that your director would normally count in and then it has an ending, that's kind of how we want to treat this. Um, now, that isn't to say that there aren't going to be maybe moments where it sounds like it could end. Endings are always kind of like one of the more interesting things on how this uh, works. Um, but, uh, you know, don't just stop in the middle um, because uh, you don't want to do it anymore. And um, it should have some kind of clear start. So everyone needs to be kind of on the same page before it starts. Um, now, there's a couple questions here that often get asked or uh, they get asked beforehand or after the fact sometimes. Um, and I think when we think about freely improvised music, sometimes we can think of um, music that doesn't have any kind of tonality. Uh, it can sound like kind of atonal or without kind of like a, a pitch center. Um, it can, um, and this kind of points to rule number two. Or it, it could, it could totally be in the key of G major. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be talked about beforehand. Maybe it happens by accident. Uh, it's okay to play within a key, um, but you also don't have to feel constrained by playing in a key. So it could start in a key and move to a different key or no key at all. It could start in no key at all and move to a very sonorous key and move out of it. There are no rules about how this happens. You don't think that you have to play atonally. Don't think that you have to play within a key, okay? Um, and the same thing goes for rhythm. Um, I, especially the percussionists, they tend to gravitate immediately to something that has some kind of pulse. Pulse is cool, that can happen, but it also could have no pulse at all. Like it could be without any kind of tempo or specific rhythm the entire piece. That can be great, um, but it also doesn't have to be that. If, if you kind of morph into something that has some kind of repeating rhythmic pattern, that's great. And again, rule number one, you don't want to play like a beat. Like you're not going to fall into something that like can be categorized as like a hip hop beat or whatever it is, you know. Um, uh, pulse is good, maybe, and maybe no pulse is good, but we don't want some kind of stylistic groove. Um, and then sometimes you might hear in freely improvised music some kind of like uh, weirdness, uh, I, you know, like the academic term for weirdness would be like extended techniques. So um, I'll display for you some extended techniques on guitar and I have a drum set here too. So maybe I'll show you some extended techniques on drum set. Um, and uh, I even have a trumpet and I'm not a trumpet player and um, uh, but I could probably show you some kind of extended technique on trumpet and that will give you a clue as to like what you could do um, with the idea of extended techniques um, in creating these pieces. So we were talking about extended techniques and um, how they can be used to help us uh, when we compose pieces spontaneously. Uh, extended techniques often provide color. Um, and uh, the simplest way for me to explain what an extended technique is, kind of playing your instrument in a way that it was not necessarily intended to be played. Um, so an extended technique on the guitar might be, well, we know how the guitar is played, right? There's strings that make sound, or they vibrate between here and here, and you can put, you change the pitch with your this hand on the fretboard, and you can strum or pick strings. So uh, an extended technique would be do, doing something other than that, like I can take my pick and I can get a scraping sound on the string like that. I could tap. That would be an extended technique. That was just slamming the pick on the fretboard on the string. I could pick behind the bridge and get... That's an extended technique. Same thing for above the neck. What are other things that I, I've in the past pulled out my thing and gotten that kind of buzzing sound to help get some color. And uh, there are other, let's see, I could, this particular guitar has two pickups, so I could turn one off and go, go between the pickups. So that's me using extended techniques to help uh, generate some color um, for our pieces. 
Um, and then I'll show you some on other instruments like drums and trumpet, even though I don't play trumpet, just as a qualifier. So we were talking about extended techniques and uh, I'm not necessarily a drummer, but I can kind of play a little bit of drums and uh, some extended techniques on the drum set itself could be, again, playing the instrument, not necessarily the way it's intended. Um, we've maybe heard this kind of sound before on drums. Using the stick to hit the edge of the cymbal gets an interesting sound. You can take the tip of the stick and rub it on the cymbal to get that kind of sound. You can also get the pressing down on the head, rubbing your finger across a coated head to get the, the similar kind of whale sound. Um, and you could reach underneath the snare drum and That's something hitting on the shells of the drums. Those are some uh, examples of extended techniques on the drums. Why don't you think about some that you could do on drums? Okay, well, I decided against embarrassing myself by trying to display some extended techniques on trumpet. That's a bad idea. I'm not a trumpet player. Um, but I will link you guys some uh, links to uh, some really cool extended techniques on various instruments. I encourage you to explore some of them and uh, to use them to add color to the pieces that we're going to spontaneously compose. And just another word to the wise there that uh, though the extended techniques are kind of fun, um, we should treat them as, you know, serious. They should be adding to the piece that we're composing. So, um, a kind of final note about uh, the process that we're about to undertake. Um, two things to be uh aware of we don't want to under listen and we don't want to over listen um and what those mean under listening is pretty clear it's like you know you're just off in your own world doing your own thing and it has nothing to do with what anyone else is playing anytime you play something on your instrument it should be adding to the musical situation um there are there's plenty of space for us all to play and we want you to fill it um, but we also don't want you to take up all of the space. So um, don't under listen. Every time you're playing your instrument, you should be thinking about how it fits in with everyone else around you. And um, the over listening part is when you're kind of just playing copycat or repeating what everyone else is playing, or you're fulfilling the same musical role as one of your contributors. Um, you... We want you to say stuff, but we don't want you to repeat <laughs> back everything that we say. It's kind of like, you know, like that annoying younger sibling or whatever, playing the copycat game uh, and repeating back, stop repeating me. You stop repeating me. Like, you don't want to do, be that musical equivalent of that, right? Um, so it's cool to show that you are listening um, and even responding to musicians, but uh, don't kind of, you know, don't over listen. Don't copycat them. Um, and uh, yeah, I said that I wasn't going to embarrass myself playing trumpet. This kind of goes to the next point. I'm not the biggest fan of like switching instruments. Again, it's fun and you should definitely play other people's instruments if they let you, you know, COVID-19. So, you know, make sure that it's safe for you to do so. Um, you know, I learned how to play drums just because like some drummers would show, show me how to do a couple things on drums and I really loved it. So it's not that I don't want you to play other instruments, but Again, going back to like, we should take this seriously. And if you don't play trumpet, maybe it's not a great idea for you to like play trumpet during this process. Um, that is to say, you know, if you're a multi-instrumentalist or you're gonna take it very seriously um, in creating music, that then that's encouraged. But in general, when students start switching instruments and stuff like that, we don't get very good results um, because everyone's kind of just uh, messing around. And that's, uh, you know, Maybe save that for a different time. <laughs> Play in the sandbox with someone else's instrument uh, a different time. So uh, now let's talk about how we can generate some of these pieces with some ideas. 
So now we're going to talk about some of the ways that we can start generating these pieces because as we mentioned before, if we just let you run free, we might have some good results sometimes, but more often than not, there'd be a lot of bumps and bruises along the way. So if we set up some basic guidelines, uh, we can have some success pretty early on. Um, so what are some of these ideas? Um, there's a big word called syntactic ways of uh, uh, forming pieces. Um, and uh, syntactic forms uh, or syntactic ways of doing this would be uh, with melody, uh, harmony, or rhythm. Um, so we could say something like if we were thinking about rhythm as one of the syntactic ways of doing it, we could say, let's do something that has a pulse, um, that, that does have a pulse at some point during the piece, and then it has this rhythm. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. So at some point during the piece, I want us all to have that kind of rhythm. By saying that in the beginning, and us knowing that at some point in the piece we're going to do that, it kind of like gives us some direction and uh, it allows us to kind of like uh, plant that seed and, and water it and watch it grow musically. Another thing that we could do is to talk about the harmony. Um, so we could say something as simple as no chords. No one play any chords. And if you're a trumpet player, you're like, well, great, I can't play chords at all. But uh, you could think of that, you know, as like, well, when I'm playing on my trumpet, I don't want my note to like re be ringing out with two other people so that it sounds like a chord. And if you're a guitar player, you're like, okay, well, I just, I'm not gonna play any chords. Um, or it could be only chords, right? Like, so again, we're kind of pointing to rule number two that you can like uh, kind of do anything at any time or, you know, think of things the complete opposite way. When I say chords, then you could be like, okay, well, we could have no chords or we could have chords um, or some kind of combination in between, right? Um, and it's good to kind of like nail down what it is you're going to do when you uh, start off on your journey. Um, and as far as melody for syntax, you could come up with some kind of melodic fragment ahead of time, um, or you could uh, just appoint like one of the, let's say there's five musicians, right? And um, you could say, that person, that one person over there, you, you're playing saxophone. Why don't you be the only one that plays melody and the rest of us will do other things to support the melody. Um, so that's one, those are some ways to like kind of uh, generate pieces syntactically. So if we have syntactic ways of forming pieces, then we must have non-syntactic ways of forming pieces, right? And what are non-syntactic ways of forming pieces? Well, when we're talking about non-syntactic things in music, we're talking about things like range. So, you know, you know the range of your instrument or the range of the piece in general. Timbre, um, or the tone color of a particular instrument or piece. Articulation, dynamics, duration, tempo. These are all things that we can uh, decide on what to do ahead of time to help us generate the piece. So, and you can combine syntactic with non-syntactic, right? So we could take something like that rhythm that we had before. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. Some kind of underlying pulse like that. Boom, boom. And then we could say there's five musicians. Uh, you on trumpet over there. Why don't you play as low as you can the entire piece? And then... Why don't we have the piano player play as high as they can the entire piece? And then everyone else, they can kind of do their own thing and make, make sure not to forget the bomb bomb, right? So by setting up those parameters, then we have some guidelines and everyone else can kind of fill in between. Um, and you could also do things like, uh, uh, we're, let's talk about dynamics. You could start a piece super quiet in the middle, get super loud, and then I want you to, at the very end, to end with a whimper and super quiet. So it has this bell curve kind of dynamic thing, right? And even just that one simple idea could uh, form a really great piece that gets improvised by all of the musicians. Um, duration is another fun one. Why don't, why don't all of us play uh, an entire piece based on the idea of short long? So da da. And then that can get, kind of get peppered throughout the ensemble, right? Um, so those are some non-syntactic ways of forming pieces. Some other ways to form pieces here are to do uh, what, are, for lack of a better term, called games. 
Um, one of the more common games to do in this situation is to have everyone sit in a circle. It doesn't have to be in a circle. It just kind of helps facilitate the whole thing. So you don't have to like rearrange the whole room if you don't want to. Um, if it's set up for whatever ensemble, um, you could have everyone sitting in their chairs, but it just gets a little bit um, more difficult to navigate the traffic. Um, but have everyone sit in a circle maybe and um, do the handoff game is what I call it. So we could start, we pick one person to start in the circle. Um, and then they play unaccompanied solo for 30 seconds to a minute, maybe. And as they're playing solo, the person to their right starts to join them. And they play together for 30 seconds to a minute. And then after 30 seconds to a minute of playing together, the first person that started playing eventually tapers off. And so the second person is playing unaccompanied for... 30 seconds to a minute and then the person to their right uh, or left or whatever whichever direction you go joins them so you're handing it off so that it's always overlapping solo duo solo duo solo duo and you kind of weave that throughout the whole circle and by the end of the piece it's like a totally different uh, uh, piece than where you started it's almost like musical telephone so that's a fun game to do um, and you can do that with more than just one and two people at a time, too. You could do groups of two and three or, you know, however you want to do that. Another fun game that I had a lot of success with in one of my college ensembles is um, having the entire ensemble play. And if you remember back to Stockhausen, he doesn't like that. That's too many people playing at one time, right? But I made a specific rule that no more than three people can be playing at one time. So the entire ensemble is engaged. And they're all listening, but they're all listening to see, can I play now? And, and when I play, is it going to be adding something? So everyone was involved and engaged and listening and participating, but only three people were playing at a time. And then, you know, you don't want to be the bad person that is playing the entire time because you can't take the horn out of your mouth or put the sticks down, right? So uh, you have to share the space again, and uh, that can be a really fun way to... Um, uh, create some really cool improvised composition. Um, so I, the large ensemble with only two or three or four people at a time is a fun way to do it. Um, another game that you can do is to have a, a fake conductor so that uh, you can have the entire ensemble playing and then uh, a person standing up there giving hand signals and you could uh, have assigned hand signals as to what they mean, kind of like we were talking about with Walter Thompson and sound painting, or the person could just be acting out musical directions, uh, and you have to interpret the person's uh, musical directions that they're giving with their hands. So if I was up in front of you and I went, I imagine some of you would probably raise your volume, but maybe this means raise your pitch as well. Or if I went like this, what would you do musically if I was doing this to the ensemble? Or if I went like this, what, like, how would you interpret these hand signals? That's a, that's a fun game to do. Um, so those are some uh, games that I would suggest doing to help inspire some pieces. You can also have notation based pieces. Um, so I'm going to share a, an example with you. Um, from one of my older albums. The album's called Tone, and the piece is called Alpenglow. And uh, it's just three notes and some directions written in English and uh, a curvy line. And uh, it generated a whole piece that ended up being on one of my albums. So um, this is intended just to be like an inspiration for like one of the simple things that you could do to generate an entire piece of improvised music.
one of the ways of generating improvised music composition that has been some of the most fulfilling and fun for me has been incorporating interdisciplinary means of generating compositions. And that's a big word, interdisciplinary. What it means is basically drawing from other sources than music to generate these musical pieces. Um, I mentioned uh, Stockhausen at the beginning and maybe a couple times after. And uh, this uh, approach to this music was like introduced to me at the University of Nevada. And one of our professors had these texts from Stockhausen um, that uh, were simple and vague and kind of confusing sometimes, but they are a really great way of um, inspiring us to make a musical composition. So I will share some of those in the slides that follow here. So after seeing those Stockhausen texts, you can imagine that you could also do some stuff with poetry. Um, in the past with some of my ensembles, I've just written out some kind of like uh, flowery prose and poetry on the whiteboard, a couple lines here and there. And um, we've done pieces based on those. Um, you can also do things with images. Um, you could bring in some pictures and tell the musicians that we're going to play this piece and it's a, you know, picture of whatever topic that you want to, uh, to try to convey through music. Um, uh, another kind of cool idea is you could try to find like a really old silent film, um, that doesn't have any, you know, spoken word from the actors or anything and, uh, provide a soundtrack for a silent film. Um, so you pop on the movie and then everyone tries to play music representing what's happening on the screen. Um, that's a really fun way to do it. Um, I've also done a piece that I call Near Far, uh, which kind of, you know, it was like a joke based on, <laughs> is it Grover? <laughs> One of the Sesame Street characters kind of running to the front of the screen going near and then running all the way to the back of the room going far. And uh, the, the way we played this piece was to, we started in the middle of the room. It's a big old band room, right? And we started in the middle of the room as close as we could. And the, the point of the piece was to play and improvise music. And by the end of the piece, we're gonna be in the four corners of the room. Um, so the music, you know, that was a really interesting experiment, the near far. So, you know, that's just, it's supposed to be an idea that you can use actual physical space to generate a piece. Um, and, uh, there's also the idea of just like planting a visual prompt, uh, as a seed in your head. Um, I can, uh, show you guys another link of, uh, something from one of my more recent albums, uh, Evil Twin. There's a tune that we ended up calling Web City on it. Um, and the inspiration for that piece was a spider web. All I said was, okay, let's play a spider web. So we improvised an entire composition based on the tune, uh, or based on the idea of a spider web. So those are some ideas to help generate pieces.
So to wrap it up here, we're going to add one final part to this process, and that's the feedback component that should happen after each time we play a piece. Um, when we're in class, let's pretend that this is happening at the beginning of jazz band on a Friday or something like that, right? And uh, because we know that we should only have four or five musicians playing at a time, um, the rest of the class is sitting there listening. Well, it, maybe you played a piece called Spiderweb, right? And uh, and everyone is listening and the musicians played and went really well. There was a really cool ending. Um, you get to talk about that. The musicians should talk, reflect upon and think critically about like what they were doing in the moment and how it went well. And like they could also reflect on how 
uh, they responded to other musicians, right? And those are the musicians talking about their process. But the listeners should also be part of this because at some point they're going to be one of the performers as well. Um, so they can talk about like how the musicians' performance like landed on them. Did they did they active uh, or accurately depict the the picture that was on the screen that they uh, pro projected up there, or the uh, the poem that was uh, that the piece was derived from? Um, so uh, incorporating you know your instructor and the listeners and the performers into a feedback process at the end of these pieces is going to make each and every piece better and better as you get to go along. So um, use that as an opportunity to, to grow and also to celebrate some of your successes because I, I guarantee you that with this process, you're going to have some really magical musical moments. And it's uh, some of the most fulfilling playing that I've ever done. And I also have found that it totally informs my uh, improvisational process uh, when it comes to playing jazz and it also informs my compositional process when it comes to writing my own tunes so this is a really great way um, for us to perform music learn about music and to learn more about ourselves and uh, i hope you have a lot of fun